Jason Appley. Welcome back to The Realignment. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Good to see you, Lisa. Ditto. So this episode is going to do a couple of things. One, it's going to indulge in Sagar and my deep interest in the history of NPR, which may seem random, but if there is one thing that definitely brings back 1990s memories, it's just getting exposed to NPR, listening on the radio when our parents were driving us to school. The whole reason why I'm interested in politics and news and everything was definitely the fact that I spent probably untold amounts of time with the voices you're really talking about. Um, So I think this is really interesting. Cool. That's great. That's great. You're my audience, so I'm glad to hear you say that. (laughs) We love it. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, go ahead, Marshall. No, it's okay. Yeah, so we were explaining this a bit before the show, but the reason why we wanted to bring you back, and I also want to pay you one final last like review up compliment. When we brought you on to talk about Ted Turner and Sienna, that was a bit of a random choice. We just loved the book and said, hey, it's December. It's not quite in the deep politics every day, but let's just talk about something. But we got amazing feedback on the episode. And someone specifically said, I didn't think I was going to be interested in this topic, but I came away from this just understanding how the news industry and technology and media worked. So that's what we want to really get to, because that provided us a bit of an impetus for using this as a way of talking about a media industry that's definitely upended during COVID, even before COVID, to tie this into the past and then look into the future. I'm so happy to hear you say that. And whoever said that, I love them because, you know, it so amazes me that people don't think that history is a natural starting point and understanding where we are today. I spent the last year when I wasn't writing this book immersed in pandemic history because I was so curious about how we dealt with things before. And so understanding where we are now, it just seems like such a duh natural to me. Um, and clearly you have very intelligent listeners who understand that, you know, to, to get where we are today, to understand where we are today, um, we have to understand how it, how we got here. And I didn't, none of this stuff was stuff I've known and I've pretty much lived much of it. So that, that's the other reason too. It's not just people who are younger, but people who have lived it themselves in those places. So many people said to me about the CNN book. I didn't know any of that. And some of them spent decades there. So that's a big compliment when you hole up and do the thankless, crazy work of writing the book. So thanks again. Lisa, one thing I want to get from you on this, first of all, is why you decided to write the book this way, specifically with the characters, but also give us a general purpose history of NPR and tie it to where we are today. Because it's kind of crazy uh, when you're reading it to think about how we're coming full circle in terms of audio. The vast majority of the people listening to this are just listening to my voice. Audio has become an explosion. There are, I mean, I remember when I first discovered that people were watching podcasts. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, like, So people like watch people talk and we have thousands of people who do that here too, which is all good. I totally understand it now. I actually even do it myself sometimes. Um, and I understand people switch back and forth. So take us through that, both in terms of why I decided to write the book, the history of audio as this format, NPR specifically, and then tie it a little bit today. Okay, and I've got two minutes, right? Uh, <laughs> you so, have got all the time you need. Thanks. So, so um, I'll, I'll braid the answers to those two questions together. Uh, it's so incredible to think that in the 1960s and 70s, radio was the hidden medium, especially educational media, which educational media, which became public broadcasting. Uh, as television dawned, radio got kind of shunted to the side. And, you know, you listen to it in the car. You might listen to it while you were making dinner in the kitchen, listen to AM radio. You'd maybe have a news break. Um, but, but once television came on the scene and big-footed radio out of the picture as an entertainment, you know, family sitting around the living room listening to it kind of thing, radio was kind of left for dead. Like we talked last time about how UHF was the lunatic fringe of broadcasting back in the 70s, um, radio was eh. And what happened for me was I finished writing that CNN book and my editor, I said to my editor, I'm gonna go to graduate school to study biography. And he's like, you're, well, yeah, he didn't say you're old, but he said, why would you do that? And uh, you know, you're writing these books. And he said, cause I love biography and I wanna have the degree and I wanna understand it from a different point of view. And a couple of days later, he called me and Cokie Roberts had just died. 
And he said, well, you want to write biography. How about you write a biography of Koki Roberts? Because he saw the, you know, outrageous grief and you know, sympathy for this woman. People, many people didn't know. They felt such ownership of her. And I thought about it. And I, to be honest, I knew, you know, I knew Koki Roberts was Koki Roberts, but I didn't really understand her history. I'm not a big political junkie. So I wasn't one of those morning show you know, diehards who would have seen her for years, but I knew she was huge. And I knew it was tragically sad that at 75, she died of cancer, which she thought she'd beat. And I thought about it, thought about it. I talked with a couple of people about it and they said, you know, the founding mothers of NPR is a really interesting story. And digging a little bit deeper, I realized, wow, the founding NPR was chartered in 1970. This year, May 3rd to be specific, is the 50th anniversary of the first news broadcast from NPR. So ding, 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 peg. I you know, called up the editor and I said, I like the Koki idea, but I, it just feels better for me, especially having just written that book about the birth of CNN, let's look at the birth of NPR. And so in sort of a roundabout way to answer your question, I start thinking, okay, Susan Stamberg, Linda Wertheimer, Nina Totenberg, and Koki Roberts were this, you know, quartet of people. Uh, actually, the three, the three latter women were really, really close friends. Susan was slightly older, is slightly older, and, and slightly apart from them, different kind of ethos, more about that in a minute. But nonetheless, they called themselves the founding mothers of NPR. And as I was researching their respective histories, set against the backdrop of the creation of NPR, because Susan and Linda showed up in 71, Nina showed up in 74, uh, Koki came in 78. So literally that whole first 10 years of NPR was, they were, they were hugely instrumental in getting it out there on the map at you know being the public voice but what also occurred to me was that this is when the women's movement was exploding so not only were they instrumental to the creation of NPR and establishing it as a force that became what it is today they were busting down barriers that women had met in the news business for years because people had a token woman in a newsroom, maybe, and that token woman covered maybe weather or maybe women's news. It was extremely unusual and very difficult for women to get on the air jobs or even byline jobs, even you know, where who, who cares if the person is reporting, who, who should care about any of it, but it was really hard for women to get jobs as bylined reporters anywhere. And so, all of those stories twinned together, uh, braided together, seemed natural to me. Like the last book, it just seems like, wow, I can't believe nobody's ever stitched this together before. And then, and I'll stop talking in just a second, then what happened was I realized there's no way I'm going to write a, what they call in biography, cradle to grave of NPR or of these women in a year, if I have to write it in a year to make the deadline so that it comes out for NPR's anniversary. And that's when I was sitting right before the pandemic shut everything down at the University of Maryland Hornbeck Library, this amazing broadcasting research library where Susan Stamberg had left her papers. Thank goodness. And there's so much material there and fabulous librarians. And there I am, it's freezing cold. I show up every day, take off my coat, sit down, they wheel out the boxes. And I'm reading about Frank Mankiewicz, the third mm -hmm. president of NPR. And I thought, wow, this is an incredible story. And I, I, I'd be surprised how many people who work at NPR today, much less listeners, know that Frank Mankiewicz was simultaneously the man who brought NPR to even greater acclaim alongside these women and then almost killed it. <laughs> so it just seemed like a perfect gem of a story. And as you said in the beginning, or as your listener had pointed out, it, it really is so instructive. Everything's cyclical, politics, everything. Life is cyclical. So it's the media stories are cyclical too. And the idea that NPR had started as this sleepy, 
kind of nobody knew if it was going to make it. These women kind of got their way, made their way in the in the place just because they were ambitious and they had the jobs and they were in there and it was kind of like, oh, you want to do a story? Oh, you want to host? You want to do this? That, that's how it really basically worked at the very beginning. It was classic startup. And then um, as it graduated to the next level, it almost died. It's such a fascinating story. I hope you'll all read it. Yeah. And let's talk about structure for a second, because we have a decent international listener slip slash a listenership, which probably doesn't listen to NPR. Okay. So let's talk about the structure of NPR. So NPR, as I understand it, is a nonprofit corporation. So given that context, and if you're not watching the video, you're seeing me trying to wait until I get corrected for a misstatement. But as a nonprofit corporation, what does failure even look like? How can you fail when you have this national mission, you receive a degree of government support? How does it? How is it possible that a model like that could lead to failure in the 70s? Excellent question. Well, you know, the misperception of nonprofits, and I know a fair amount, I'm certainly not an expert, but having written my Joan Crock book and, you know, danced around the nonprofit world for so long, um, I'm intrigued by this belief that just because a nonprofit is nonprofit doesn't mean it has to make money or has to make an income and balance the books the way you do personally and your employers do personally. I mean, there's uh, organizationally. Uh, so the misperception is that a nonprofit just sails along and raises money and does good and yeah, 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 there you go. I mean, just to go back to the roots um, of public broadcasting, public broadcasting was established by President Johnson in the late 60s because commercial broadcasting was making a fortune and had this, as we talked about the last time, this triopoly, these three networks controlled the airwaves, both on the local and national level. And that was worrisome to people. People were worried, A, that three companies controlled public airwaves that, um, Basically, that framework that was set up was to sort of offset the idea that these three networks controlled um, broadcasting. And the, the model proposed was like the BBC um, and probably, it, I don't know much about how it's set up in other nations, but I think it's probably similar that, that a government funds an, a media outlet and that, you know, basically in essence controls the media outlet. But that's what that's not what they wanted to do here in the late 60s when they were setting up public broadcasting. Basically what they were saying is we need to set up an alternative to, to commercial broadcasting that doesn't just focus on the commercial interest, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have to balance the books or raise money or get money in the tent to do the productions that it does. Now, of course, public broadcasting evolved gradually just as you know every startup does. And I, I can talk more about that in a second, but just in answer to your question, it's the, it's the idea that a, a public, a nonprofit can just you know do whatever it wants and it, it can't. I mean, that they're always bad guys, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I want to get to, Lisa, and to us, I think in particular, and probably a lot of our audience, which is it was fascinating to me to read the genesis of listener supported media. And I think this is very important in the context of where we're at today in the Substack revolution um, and all of that. And I definitely want to hear your thoughts. I love the story itself of how this kind of came about. Could you tell it to the audience about how NPR got to the point of soliciting donations and receiving and creating, I think not even really understanding at that point how much they meant to the lives of so many people who were willing to be like, take my money, I love your product. That's something that I would love to hear about. You know, it's so scary how people are so willing to give money to something they love and not think about how it's spent, but that's a yes. whole other conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it is important to say with NPR, vis-a-vis -vis that comment that NPR was not set up to raise money from the public. It was, and, and it's still to this day confusing for even people who give lots of money, including by the way, Joan Kroc, who gave NPR when she died $250 million or what wound up being $250 million. Basically people, when they're listening in their local markets, don't understand the difference between 
this little receptacle or big receptacle in whatever market I live in versus the network itself. It's not dissimilar from I watch local ABC, W, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. to see the ABC network. And yet, you know, the local news is produced produced by the local station, whoever owns that. And then the national news comes from the network. That's basically how NPR and its member stations are set up. And in its very beginnings, uh, NPR was not set up to raise money. The people who raised the money were the local stations. Um, the, The finances were completely different in that the local stations today get money from their listeners. They get money from selling basically ads. They get some government money. Whatever government money there is, is given to the local stations more than it is to NPR, the network. Mostly Ah. that to make sure that the local stations serve the local audience. The big concern in the 60s and today too, of course, is that this hyper-local thing that we all know is important and we've certainly lived why it's important um, was was starting to eradicate. And so they wanted to bolster local media. Um, okay, I'm getting off on too many tangents, but basically NPR, the local station, takes that money now and pays at some sort of fee that is something to do with their listenership and the market size to NPR, the network. NPR, parallel to that, is raising money from listenership I'm, so, I'm sorry, not from listenership, from, from sponsorship. Yeah. An individual doesn't give their money to NPR, typically. Typically, they give it to the stations. But all of that, of course, as you're saying, the, all bets are off now that, you know, what's local? I might be listening. I'm here in Florida right now, and I'm right. listening to KCRW music because I love it. But um, so it, it, that world is really strange. But what happened in the 70s, to your point, is – that was all being created and nobody really knew exactly how it was going to work out. And when this crisis point happened in the early eighties, because of this overspending, um, it was natural for the people within NPR, the network to say, let's go to the listeners. We know the listeners love us, but the problem was that the stations kind of like, well, we love you and we need you too, but we are the ones who go to the listeners to ask them for money. So it, it's it's braided together and it's confusing. I think not to to suggest that they do it for nefarious means, but um, it works to their advantage that people really don't know the difference. Yeah, here's one of my questions. Here, can you talk about the logic there? So, like, was there some tortured, um, was some there a tortured debate inside the company around, or sorry, inside the and inside NPR around asking that question? They're broke because I think this is very important. It essentially is what happened in the blogosphere 20 years later, where they were giving away their content for free. Mm-hmm. Nobody quite yet got to the point where they were just like, hey, like give if you like my content, give us money. Some of the infrastructure wasn't necessarily there either. And people were, there's the assumption. People are just too used to listening to stuff with ads. They're never going to pay for it. Obviously, that was totally wrong. Um, not that advertising supported media is important as well. I'm just curious to think about that logic because it literally is happening again right now. And there's the same level of debates. Well, and I lived it at the New York Times, which, of course, is not a nonprofit. But in the late 90s, when I was working on Cyber Times, they when, when the New York Times first went up on the web, everybody was just building their website if they were smart enough to know that they needed to and just throwing stuff at it. And I was fortunate enough to back end into this section, Cyber Times, that needed columnists to write for it. And no one who had any print cred wanted to write for the damn web. So people like me back ended into these jobs and they had to pay us really well because they needed people who cared and knew and wanted to. And so when we were doing that, the New York Times on the web in the earliest days didn't charge, did charge internationally. I, I don't even, I should ask the guys why they did that. For some reason, they thought that people internationally should pay. There was a paywall. And then there wasn't one, if I remember correctly, in the very beginning of the New York Times website. So everybody's always experimenting and trying to see what the viewers will or listeners or audience will will pay for. And you know, to your point with NPR in the very beginning, they weren't, they got a little sliver of this public 
Broadcasting Act money only because there were a bunch of guys from educational radio stations around the country who said, you're not going to leave. It was a public television act to begin with. You're not going to leave broad, uh, radio out. You have to make this the public broadcasting act. Oh, no, 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 no. We'll include radio down the road. We've got to get public TV set up first. These guys said, no, 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 no. You have to put radio in. So they they basically t- scotch taped it into the public Broadcasting Act that made made it the Public Broadcasting Act and allocated something like $5 million to create a radio service. And nobody knew what that was. Mm -hmm. All they knew is that there were educational stations around the country that wanted to get some better programming that wasn't just the programming that University of Fill in the Blank might have from students or professors, people reading books or whatever they did on you know classes they would they would broadcast popular lecture series um and there was no concentrated media effort it was just a real playpen and it was a wonderful playpen if you got your voice on there and you got your message out or your music or whatever but there was no concentrated status constant concentrated strategy so npr is set up in 1970 chartered in 1970 to provide on a national level some sort of programming to unify all these stations around the country and not just unify them, but really basically to up the discourse intelligence of of radio and not just have it be bleeding commercial pop music. Mm. So 1970, these guys, mostly guys were hired and uh, they came from all over and they thought about it and they talked about it. And the first thing they did was they create all things considered, which went on the air May 3rd, 1971. They didn't even really know what all things considered was going to be. They thought, well, two hours seems too long. So we'll do it for 90 minutes. <laughs> Over arbitrary, <laughs> everything really yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, it, it. The, the, the founders even said that, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe we can do 90 minutes. An hour's too short. Right. So then they had five reporters. They had a host who lasted a matter of months. Um, you know, they, they didn't have official job titles, most of them. It was kind of like, oh, you got here today. Why don't you produce? Oh, it, Linda Wertheimer, who hosted the show for years, started out at the very beginning and she wound up being the director of the show just because she was organized and she you know, hated to see things be disorganized. So that's how in, uh, you know, unformed it was. And it, it hadn't occurred to them, oh, my God, we got to raise money. Oh, my God, what are we going to do when we need to expand? It was only when, I mean, it was gradually. I shouldn't say it's all about Frank Mankiewicz. But as Frank Mankiewicz showed up um, in the late 70s, he, he recognized that he needed to fight for more money and, and think about more creative ways to bring in revenue and to expand the perch. And... That's this is a very long way of saying that there's no simple way to show exactly how this whole public broadcasting finance of, unfolded. You know, James Letter, Ledbetter, I don't know if you ever had him on. He's amazing. He wrote a book um, about the financing of public broadcasting. That's really excellent. It's 20 years old, but it all it's all about this crossroads that that it came to where it became basically a viable concern. No, it was not a for profit business where there was stock, but there are people making a lot of money in public broadcasting, even if they don't own stock in the company. Um, We'll get to that, too. But uh, yeah, so so I don't know if that's answering your question, but it's just it's it's. It, it was a slow march. And, and yes. early on, they decided that it wasn't going to be like the BBC, that they didn't want government involvement, that they didn't want to tax the radios and the televisions to pay for it, um, that it was going to be an allocation of money that um, that launched it. And then, of course, it has to go from there. It has grown from there. Well, there's there's so much there, Lisa. So I want to I want to just tee up two things for you based on what you said taking whatever order miss one pick one whatever works for you here so one can you talk about the implications for the media industry of the idea of your most intense 
listeners, fans, community really paying? Because what's been interesting is we're going 40 years later, you're seeing even before the pandemic, you have a publication like Vox, which is a for-profit under Vox Media, a company which is trying to either IPO or go probably through a SPAC, actually creating a membership. So this isn't even a nonprofit, it's the same underlying idea. And one of my favorite stories during um, Up All Night about Ted Turner is back before the CNN days, he actually did a bit of, I mean, he paid people back, but it was sort of a television-based, we need money to keep this station alive idea. Mm -hmm. So- I, it's the implication of this idea just are just very fascinating, both when you're seeing for profits do it. So that's more of a comment. But the second part is implicit or sort of explicit in everything you're saying is this point that this is this nonprofit activity. There's government, there is the local, and it's about balancing between those things. But there's this really intensive debate around whether news as a whole is something that can even be done in a for-profit manner. So if you're looking at local news right now, you're seeing this huge problem where if you're, for example, I'm from Oregon, my local hometown paper, that is a paper that used to have a total monopoly. If you wanted to get the news, you had to subscribe to the Lake Oswego Review. However, today you just go online and that's available for free, honestly, probably with better coverage. And if anything, that local paper probably just re-aggregates national news and gives it to you that way of some classified attached. So can you just speak broadly about the whole public fundraising idea today, but then two, whether or not news is even something that can be done um, from a you know for-profit perspective? Because the one thing I'll just add is that there are actually a bunch of states which are saying, hey, like maybe the government should subsidize local news heavily. There's just a lot, there's a lot going on there. Yeah, wow. And that's, if we could answer that question, we should just all go do it, right? Like, let's go buy the LA Times, the Tribune, papers, take them all public. I love how everybody thinks it's, oh, I'm just, I'm a rich person. I'm going to buy the Tribune company and take them all nonprofit and, right. you know, local. I, good luck. Great. Go. I'll come work for you. But yes. no, but, you know, you said something that really resonated for me. And that is when you, when you were talking about Vox and just the whole Substack subscriber model. Everybody wants community, right? Community. I mean, we've always wanted community, duh. But now we call it, this is your, I'm part of your community. Thank you for welcoming me into your community. And that, that probably did emanate in some form or fashion from the NPR sense. You know, people date, you know, I put in your dating profiles or doesn't NPR, I think some NPR stations, oh, yeah. singles nights for 20s or 30s and 40s, you know, like however old you are, you go to, it's, it's, it's a religion to people in a different way than, you know, David Muir. I'm sure there are a lot of people who think David Muir is really foxy, but they, you know, it's not like they're sending <laughs> yeah. money. Our millennial audience is like, who the hell are you talking about? I know, sorry. David Muir, <laughs> Nightly News, ABC, yeah, yeah. your parents <laughs> watch him during Christmas break. Yeah. My mother watches it. And I, I never had seen him. He's very cute. I can see why all the you know, all <laughs> ladies think he's adorable and gay yeah. men. I mean, like, he's really great. But, but no, the whole idea that, that you feel this ownership of media, not just that you're like my mother sitting in the living room watching the, the nightly news at the end of the day, which is so quaint and retro, but but that you feel you there was this big controversy earlier this year. They made an NPR AF shirt. <laughs> Somebody I know who's older said to me, who actually was involved in the early days of NPR, he said to me, What does that mean? <laughs> and I had to think about it for a second. And I thought, It's not autofocus. Oh my God. Oh my God. And when I told him, he was understandably offended not to sound like really square which right. sounds square in itself but but anyway people are so rabid you know tattoos for npr they love it and tote i bags. think that tote bags, oh, those certainly are tote bags right. mugs but i think that that people are so starved for ways to belong and this is aside from the pandemic and to show you know it is it is a political statement in you in a way not even if it's political that you say i'm a, a fan of whatever by wearing a sweatshirt from your hometown or you know it's it's a way of identifying and npr even back in the 70s, before millions and millions of people listened to it, had started that. And that's why you can thank mostly, I mean, all the women, but Susan Stanberg in particular, because she was the host, the first female host of a national nightly 
news broadcast. And even though she didn't want to think of it as news because she wasn't a hard news person the way Nina, Koki, and Linda were. In fact, she was decidedly anti that kind of inside what we now call inside the beltway kinds of news. She wanted, if she, her famous example was when Jimmy Carter got elected, she didn't want to talk to Jimmy Carter. She wanted to talk to his dentist about his teeth because his smile was so famous. And what could she learn about him by talking to his dentist, which is very smart because, you know, he had lots to say about that. But she wound up interviewing Jimmy Carter, by the way. But that's a that's another story. But but so I think that NPR didn't set out and it's like when I had this conversation in the early days of the dot-com era, the guys who set out in their garage to make the next thing that you set out to do in your garage that made you really rich usually didn't succeed. But the people who came up with an idea because they were really passionate about it and, and authentically, we never use that word then, but really passionate about it, they were the people who often succeeded. And that's what happened with NPR. It, they decided not to sound screechy and broadcasting, which is what broadcasting was at that point. And they allowed people in who weren't just white men. And um, they particularly allowed in women. They didn't allow in tons of people of color, but that's a problem that continues to this day. And that's a whole other issue. But they, they opened the doors in a way that other broadcasters hadn't done, both by the tone of the stories, the types of stories, and the people who presented those stories. And in so doing, um, especially since most of their audience in the very beginning wasn't in the big media cities on the coasts. It was in, in the heartland and the heartland didn't have a great local newspaper necessarily. And so all of a sudden, you know, you're hearing this warm voice bring the news to you in a really humane way. And that made people really fall in love with it. And as a consequence, they could, they, meaning the stations, could raise money based on the fact that people really felt this ownership of this organization. Now, of course, it helps because this concept of nonprofit makes you think, oh, well, they're hard up. You know, I'm not going to give money to a rich person. I'm not going to give money to the ABC with David Muir, who's probably making however many millions of dollars a year, a year. but I'll give money to NPR because they need my support. Well, Again, people don't realize they're not giving money directly to NPR. And now, today, they don't realize that many people in NPR, in the public radio sphere, are making serious money. They're not, you know, not poorly paid. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like I lost one part of your question. I'm sorry. Well, no, I, I just want to call off a quick comment and I'll throw this to Sagar because I want to highlight something you just said about the nature of these passion projects in media versus the very we're gonna go out and build xyz media media empire bit because if you're looking at just the carcasses of media companies that just really failed on the internet especially the past 10 years so if people who went out and said you know what i'm gonna use facebook to build cnn for millennials or i'm gonna do this or this for that um, it, it's, it's funny, something that Sagar and I missed out on is, for example, when Vice News used to be this cool thing back in the <laughs> late 90s and 2000s when obviously Vice was out of control in a bunch of different very specific ways, but it really used to be this gritty, edgy, late 90s like Lad magazine, which actually had a real audience, had real people there. And then you see this transition to, hey, like we're going to turn this into a $5 billion company. Shane Smith gets his awesome, you know, Lambo and the mansion in LA. So that changes this. So I just want to call out just the real need, especially as media refocuses on smaller audiences and telling specific stories cheaper, like a podcast or something like that. That's just a really important thing. But I want to throw this to you, Sagar. Yeah, I, you know, Lisa, there's this thing I'm thinking about, about that emotional connection that you have, you know, obviously with the founding mothers of NPR. I think of like my dad and Planet Money. I mean, he loves Planet Money or like Diane Reem and books. They're just, these are, these are like characters in my head. Again, I, I would never, you know, I've never met them. I probably never will, but they exist for me in a very visceral space. Mm -hmm. I'm curious whether you think that can even happen again today. And Marshall and I were talking about this in the context of like Oprah, where 
you do actually need somebody who is just this general purpose interviewer who everybody really likes, but it's very telling that it's still Oprah in 2021. It was Oprah in, in like 1975. Years and ago. it hasn't, or like, <laughs> hasn't changed. And I'm like, is it possible to be Oprah today? Like, and what are we losing by losing that, because uh, look, there's a lot of benefits to losing that actually in terms of corporate control, et cetera. You know, I've am frankly been the, one of a huge beneficiary of that. That being said, there's something really nice about having this like uniting cultural figure who is universally like beloved. We were talking about this in the context of the royal interview. Now, you, you could say it's trash or not, but like 100 million people watched it. OK, like that just doesn't happen anymore. And so from that perspective, I'm just curious from your thoughts. I, I just teed up a lot to you. Well, one, one quick, one oh, quick thing, Lisa, because I want to give context for the audience because yeah. this is actually a really interesting debate. So I was listening to a podcast actually um, that Eric Torenberg did. Listeners will remember him from January. And he was talking with a venture capitalist who said, we are never going to see Oprah's ever again. This hmm. is a VC who invests in media. And he's like, look, listen, look at the big YouTubers. No one's ever heard of most of these people. Look at most Joe Rogan's obviously very big, but most people don't actually listen to Joe Rogan in the way that you're seeing the Walter Cronkites or the Nina Totenbergs or the anchors at CNN in the 80s and 90s. No one actually has these mass audiences anymore. So what Sagar and I were debating was, A, what function does that mass audience figure serve? And in the current media dynamic, is that something that's ever going to exist again? You know, it, it is so interesting because I do remember all of that. Um, you know, the whole idea that there was a big event by Sunday night movie, you know, a movie, The Wizard of Oz, and everybody was watching it. The whole nation watched it. Um, I think we definitely are atomized in a way more than ever before because of that. You know, when I first started working in journalism, the big debate was, is news what you want to know or what, what the consumer wants to know or what they need to know? And what is it that they need to know? There was a big, it's, it's kind of funny and, and quaint right now, but the big conversation was, well, you know, most Americans don't care about international news. And that's probably true in most countries that most people really just, they need, most people aren't news junkies like you guys are and aware of what's going on in the world. Your listeners are, but most, most average people, whatever that means, that's not their thing. And so the question was how much foreign news or international news as Ted Turner rightly started to call it, do you give people if that's not of interest to them? And so now, of course, I could very easily just listen to hockey, everything, all day, every day, if that was my thing, and to the exclusion of what's going on. I mean, there are neighbors here in my mother's neighborhood, nice, you know, middle-class neighborhood. People have good jobs. Um, they don't know what the heck's going on in the immediate world around them, much less, you know, much less the much bigger world around them. So I think we lose something because of that atomized media, because you do have a choice of time and, and venue. And, you know, Oprah is a singular force. I, 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 any, how anybody could come along who equals Oprah in any sense is so in, unimaginable. And yet, you know, who knows? Maybe, yes, I, I understand what you were saying that that there's no, the, the infrastructure doesn't allow for there to be that singular voice the way it was when it was a, a triopoly or even in, in the last, you know, before the last 15, 20 years. But I'm always loath to say that there isn't. I think, you know, there's, we definitely lose something as, as a people if we're not united by that global village that McLuhan talked about um, and we, I mean, I guess we technically are in the sense that if we choose to be, we, we can tune into it, but that, that again, it erases the whole idea of everyone around me is tuned into the same, the same media. Yeah. So yeah. I yeah. want to hit something real quick, which is, I want to get meta for a second. Let's just talk about audio and what audio is because audio especially in Sagar and my side of the east coast east coast of things is newly just really 
a priority for a lot of folks. So if it's 2015, 2016, before the pivot to video failed in media, which is basically Facebook and a bunch of online publishers and platforms encourage publications to spend a lot of money on their video capacity. So people will remember now this or Mike, lots of video on your Facebook feed. That all basically doesn't work. A lot of publications shut down. So that doesn't really happen as much. That then has led to publications really focusing on audio as as a format. This is why you see everyone launching a podcast and spending less money and time on video. That's why you're seeing apps like Clubhouse or the Twitter Spaces alternative cup. And so NPR, if anything, from the story is a story of audio. So can you just speak about what audio means? Because given everything we're talking about, it's just funny that 40, 50 years later, we're still in the audio space. Um, the whole point of the 80s and cable TV, the whole point of you going to the New York Times and MSNBC, I don't think we go back to the dot-com bubble version of you and tell you that there's this huge, intense interest in audio that you, I think you'd be surprised to hear that. So I'd love to just hear your general thoughts there. Well, you know, Susan Stamberg herself says that radio has the best pictures. You know, it, it's, it's a beautiful medium. It's an evocative medium. It, it's an easier medium, clearly, obviously, to produce than television, cheaper, and you can do great stuff. And back to the whole community thing. That's why you have a listenership. People like to hear to be part of the community. And it's easier to invite people into that community than when it's got to be a slickly produced television show, you know, television pretty much by definition, although I do love watching C-SPAN and it's been very immensely helpful to me in the last two books I've written. Um, you know, television has to be produced and that that's a different sort of sensibility. So I think that we're seeing this or, or we've been seeing this attraction to, to radio or audio storytelling because it is such a beautiful evocative. It doesn't have to always be simple. Yes, there are really skilled people who are producing rich layered, you know, what do they call it? Sound rich storytelling. Mm. Um, but even without the sound rich storytelling, it, it transports you and takes you somewhere. I've recently started listening to audiobooks in, in a way that I never had That's before. Us. And and we're yeah. audiobook fiends over we're here. We're fishing oh, for that yeah. Audible sponsorship here. Yeah, please sponsor us, Audible. Yeah. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And everybody should listen to me read my books. All oh, you have the book? I've right. read them all. I but forget. Yeah. I listened to a quick thing on this. I listened to Up All Night. Did you read Up All Night? Oh, wow. You mean my book? Yeah, that's how I did up on. I did up on. Yes, I did read it. Yes, 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 I read it. Okay, it was good. (laughs) Yes, good. Okay, good. Yeah, that's what we want. But yeah, I know some people like books that are read by the author and all. I think it's important. I think it's important, especially yeah, especially if it's nonfiction. I think it makes a big difference. But yeah, so, so I think that that audio is seeing a resurgence, and of course, the other funny, haha, ironic thing is that audio never used to be so simple. I mean, it was certainly simpler than television, but if you look at what it used to look like and having to splice it and people splicing their fingers and the blood coming all over the tape and all of that, you know, it, it's now, here I am with my little $40 microphone. Yeah, look at these. And, right. right, yeah. And we're all, we're all, in, and we're, thanks to this broadband, we're all connected. So it just makes sense. I mean, of course, the mythology is that some you do it and you get rich, but at least you're able to open up. I, I produce this and host this, co-produce and co-host this um, podcast with biographers where we interview biographers every week. And I, it's not like we'd ever expect anybody's going to pay us for it. it. It's a volunteer project. It's a labor of love. But it is, it's a great way to reach people in the biography community. Um, so why not do it? Why not try it? But yeah, I, I think you definitely can thank this love that people have of, of NPR and the, the really particular brand of storytelling um, for, for that, for sure. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's just the way you viscerally feel something with audio. There's nothing else like it. Right. I, I don't know why, you know, it's like Sarah Koenig's voice. When I hear her voice, she's the serial um, host for right. people's and she's just incredible. Like she's got this like soothing tone. I could listen to that woman tell any story about anything. Uh, but I'm curious because I know the paperback of Up All Night, speaking of which is coming out and it came out right at the beginning of the pandemic. There's an entire other podcast to be had about literally like cable post Trump. 
But I'm curious for your perspective of cable during the pandemic um, and now post-Trump, where there's a lot to be made around lack of ratings. Some of it probably was going to happen anyway as a natural contraction from the election. But there is a natural thing going on here about some people having a real hard time finding other stuff to cover. Big open-ended question. I'm curious for your perspective. You know, it drives me crazy that people say there isn't enough stuff to cover. It's lazy, really, because <laughs> there's plenty of stuff to cover. Um, yeah, you, the the obvious is off the stage for now, but um, and maybe forever. Let's hope. But he, it, it's 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 so it it goes to why that whole idea of pack journalism and DC journalism just is not my cup of tea because hmm. really. Um, there is so much happening in our world that could be covered more widely. Now it's, it's, but it's not easy. And it's really not easy to do if you are on a short staff with a tight budget and a quick deadline. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the good digging is, is it needs to be done and it's hard to do and not everybody's inclined to do it. And it doesn't necessarily get your face on the air and the buck. So that's, that's a, a big issue, but you know, it's so interesting to have written this book and have it come out when it did. And having read a lot about Murdoch after I wrote the book, um, I was preparing to be interviewed for an upcoming documentary that I think is supposed to air on CNN, ironically about oh, cool. Murdoch right. yeah. and, um, and reading more about him than I ever had before, it, especially to look at him teeing up him against Turner. Uh, which I decidedly did not do in the book, probably that was dumb for the sales perspective because everybody <laughs> wanted that fight. Um, but I, but I wanted that origin story, and he wasn't there yet. But but basically, Murdoch says TV news is entertainment, mm -hmm. and that's that's it. It's it's entertainment. It you know, and yes, okay. Back to an earlier question. I, th I can't remember which one of you guys talked about it, but the whole idea that nonprofit news uh, would make it pure, it it's not going to make it pure. You still have to find an audience. You still have to, I mean, I guess I, I should never say it's not going to make it pure, but the whole mythology that, um, you know, if, if there was a government controlled television service, that it would be more sober, right. somber, and deliberate, and fair, and whatever. It, it, I don't. I don't think that that's possible. Yeah, like, have you heard of Russia? Like you know, right. it's like, you know, like I actually, I, I, at a point in my life, had to watch some Russian state TV. They know exactly uh, what people click on, don't click on, etc. And whenever it comes to subliminal messaging, it's almost like advertising. Like what they're doing is they're hooking you on to the stuff that you want, and then they'll just insert. Like by the way, Putin is really awesome. You know, it's like that's how they do their their <laughs> ads in terms of that. Yeah, I love that you were reading about murder. I read an entire biography of him. I'm curious if you read it, the Michael Wolf one which is written in a very strange way because Wolf is his own like character, but he actually spent a lot of time with Murdoch. So I'm curious, I want to get some of your reflections on that. Interesting. I did not yeah. read that one. I, well, you know what I did? I went back mm -hmm. and looked at the newspapers, the source of, of, a, of probably, well, he, he did original reporting, but I was looking at the newspaper coverage of um, basically when Fox came on the scene, MSNBC yep. came on the scene and mm -hmm. what happened in that, you know, to, in the immediate aftermath to CNN, which had been the only 24 hour news channel in town at that point. And then at, I was trying to research their kind of ongoing feud and they, you know, Ted in many ways, Ted Turner, I think was annoyed that Murdoch swooped in and stole his thunder by, you know, basically touching all kinds of media that he'd been touching, you know, and had this swagger before he arrived. So I, I spent more time looking at that than anything, mm. just because it was so interesting to see how it was drawn out, you know, the whole AOL Time Warner debacle um, and Ted exiting the stage. And really, you know, that's why it really is unfair to pit them against each other, even though they were quote unquote rivals. Um, Ted Turner had nothing to do with CNN by the time that, I mean, he never had anything to do operationally day to day with CNN. The way Murdoch sort of pulled the strings yes. on Fox, it wasn't, they're not equal. It's like, it's, it just wasn't a fair. It's a good point. It, 
quality. Yeah, because so. you know he he's so involved in the publication of his papers to the point where I mean this is I'm based off of what Michael Wolf thing. Wolf spent hours with him, actually. Like he'll literally send like he he reads all of his papers in the morning and he even edits like the headlines. It's completely right. crazy. Right, Marshall, do you have something you wanted to add? Well, yeah. Well, and this yeah. is. Lisa, I love this because there's a very small but concentrated group of like Ted Turner um, people who were just who I, I personally feel that tragedy isn't the right word, but it actually is a variety of like basically everything is AOL Time Warner's fault that you had this person who basically built so much of our what not just built but willed into existence. In good ways and bad ways, a lot of our modern world mm -hmm. who just people just don't really know about. I think the difference between Murdoch and Turner is that what Turner does is that Turner builds a model. So Turner, through his Ted Turneriness, to use proper English, gets the first commercial satellite to actually like you to, to, uh, to gets that process going so that CNN could actually go when that did not seem possible. When it's easy to see most other people would have given up. Ted Turner is the person who is taking, is going from taking over his father's billboard company in the South and then buying the Atlanta Braves and then spread that, that. I think that is just something, once again, this isn't to besmirch anything Murdoch's done in this context, but it's just to say these are just two fundamentally different business innovations and things that they do. You know, Rupert yes. Murdoch is an Australian newspaper magnet, they're just totally different. But at his core, Murdoch was a journalist, I mean, from the get go. Mm -hmm. And at his core, Ted Turner was a businessman, uh, which is why it's ironic that it's Murdoch who said that news is a business. And Ted, you know, espoused this view that that news was pure, but he was not he was not the news guy ever. And he was never the day to day operational guy. So it really it is that that's why their stories are interesting. There is a book. It, I think it, I can't even remember what it's called. It's from 20 years ago. Murdoch versus Turner. Oh, it's, 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 it's of the, of the Titans. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, yeah. It, I, it has a terrible cover. Uh, <laughs> everyone wants to look. It's, 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 I just, I know this. I'd I, I gotta forever. look this thing up. Sagar, this is one of the yeah. worst yeah. covers ever. for a book that, yeah, ever. <laughs> ever. It's like a, oh it's like a bad God. comic yeah. book or something. Yeah. <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> it's yeah. so bad. But it, 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 yeah, it was interesting to read it. You know, it's very dramatic um, and it pulls from a lot of the media coverage of the time, which was very dramatic. I think, you know, Ted was saying he was going to slug Murdoch and, you know, there was, it was, it was good bombast, punditry, bombastry, but, but that's the irony is that Ted seems like he's Mr. He was Mr. Pure journalism when he in fact was not. And Murdoch really was, but he basically in the end of the day, when it came to, television it was business 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 fox 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 and you know we know what that left us right. so yeah it's but anyway that's a whole other interesting story i wonder if rupert murdoch ever listens to npr <laughs> uh, you know it wouldn't surprise me actually it wouldn't I, surprise me yeah it would i'm curious i remember last time you told us a story how you were like what was you were the first online correspondent for msnbc because you told us, you said something interesting where you were like, you know, people talk about in terms of how it was inevitable here, but it also is a discrete choice the way the cable did become this way. It, it probably was always destined for this just in terms of the medium. I'm a firm believer in that. That being said, you are literally there from the very beginning. When you guys were there on the ground floor of MS, MAC, like, did you think this was gonna, like, at what point did you realize things were going to go the way they did with cable news? Well, see, now I, I joined MSNBC from the New York Times and I replaced a woman named Mary Kathleen Flynn. So she had technically done the job I did as okay. internet. There was one person, internet correspondent, and she was, she was it. And then I replaced her. So I came in a couple of years in, what was it? Three years into its existence. So by the time I got there, the real conversation was about this MS. NBC. There were two separate companies. The website was run by MS, Microsoft, and the, the um, TV was NBC. And then United, they had this these two properties, which you know had the usual problems that you have when you have people from two different industries running two different properties that have the same name, but are supposed to be you know, United. And the big conversation then was when is 
video going to be, when is the web going to be capable of doing what we all do now on the phone, Mm -hmm. which is watch entire movies. So that was, we were, we were preparing for that and playing around with real player. I don't even know if you remember that. Oh, I remember real players. The key thing for us, Lisa, is that we are just old enough to remember the tail end of basically all these references. Well, and you know, (laughs) you're, you, you respect history. So you know about them. You weren't there. Right. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so with, with, um, MSNBC, nobody, I do remember that when colleagues left to go to Fox and when I was downsized in this mass downsizing in 2001, before 9-11 happened, um, they had, they had a cut so 10%. From the bubble, I guess, from the 2000, from the dot-com yeah. bubble. It was, it was really more that GE, which owned NBC at that point, there was an edict that every property across GE's um, fleet of companies had to cut 10%. And they cut the internet correspondent, Um, probably a commentary on me as much as about the job itself. But I always thought that was ironic since the whole thing about MSNBC was that it was the, you know, Fox was doing its thing. CNN was still this plain Jane News in a plain, well, plain brown wrapper sounds illicit, but, you know, news without the frills, news with the star. And then MSNBC was supposed to be the rockin' experimental with with the technology. It was supposed to unite this new internet thing that was just making its way. And so, you know, they had this big layoff in 2001. And um, where was I going with that? But, but, but we were, and I, I was the person who was writing for the web, even though I was paid by MSNBC, I was writing for the web three times a week. And, and, and that, like, by the way, every single person in media does everything now, right? They write for the web, they have yeah. a podcast, they yeah. have a, but, but I was this sort of experiment who was writing and speaking on the air. And we even experimented with something that today would be a podcast. But we were playing around with the technology. And basically, a couple of years in, when there was the financial crunch, nobody cared. And that was when nobody cared about continuing that experimentation. And that was when it kind of took a turn. Uh, I shouldn't say took a left turn. It took a turn to become more pure news. Mm. Let's forget this experimental. um, You know, if you could, if we could look up like Soledad O'Brien was an anchor there in the very beginning, and she was sort of the poster person for this new high tech, highfalutin web mm-hmm. united cable thing. And that was so exciting. But it really did pretty quickly go by the wayside and become Fox, MSNBC, CNN. And that's when CNN had to really start amping up its differences or it's, it's sexiness um, yeah. and not just be the news was the star anymore. And that was, you know, there's a whole devolution there because, you know, up until that point, everybody who was in power at CNN believed fully in the news. It's news. It's hardcore mm-hmm. news. News as defined by the 90s, which was as objective as possible. And meanwhile, over there, you've got Fox doing its crazy stuff. Oh, and I was saying when people left MSNBC, when I when we I was downsized, I thought, oh my God, I hope I don't get a job at at Fox because I need a job. <laughs> but what would I do <laughs> if I got a job at Fox? Oh my God! And of course, I didn't get a job at Fox. I'm not blonde. I was also yeah. at that point 38 or whatever I was. But yeah, I was I was aging out of television at that stage. But but we had colleagues who did go over there, and I always felt kind of sorry for them. So huh. yeah, at that point, even even a few years into MSNBC's existence, it was it was much more about the three, the three sheep or something. I, I, I don't know. Fast I'm happy not to work in TV anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to, for my last question, I want to tie all this together and look a bit towards the future just to set things up. One super conventional wisdom to say this, but obviously I would say my, our generation, the millennial cohort are not intensive uh, cable news watchers. And that's not a statement about MSNBC. It's not Fox News. This isn't a political statement. It's just right. just don't subscribe. I subscribed to the Kill Mono for the, just this year for once randomly because it was a good deal. Wanted to watch sports and everything. 
Gen Z, I know for a fact, is not subscribing to cable. But then, so then it's very easy to say cable is just dying. They don't get these big audiences. But at the same time, it's a brilliant business model. You get a cable bundle. So it's it's advertising, it's the subscription, all these things. And then at the same time, you're seeing, I like the way you put this actually, how like your initial experiment at MSNBC was really trying to do it all in the ways that the most successful personalities can too. What you can do is you can wake up, you could do a TV hit, you could write an op-ed, you can appear at a live event show. That's very cool right now. You can do a podcast, all these different bits. So you have people like Megyn Kelly, you know, Obviously, it doesn't work at NBC. It doesn't work out at at Fox, but they then create a podcast. So can you just talk about the future, your just perception of the future of these industries and the way that, to keep teeing you up even further, and the way that I've appreciated about your work, which is that you're focusing on the technology that makes this possible, but then also the personalities and then the broader trends in American society, but it's sort of unifying all of it together. Well, you know, the personality thing is a really important thing to focus on because people want you, know, they relate to people. They don't relate just to a voiceless or, or a disembodied voice. Um, so I think that that, and I, I write a little bit about this in this book, this new book about NPR and the criticism of journalists becoming celebrities, uh, journalists having brands. Um, because for so long, journalists, most of them, columnists, as an exception, were people who were out reporting in the field and coming back, doing the stories. And it wasn't about me. It was, you know, maybe you liked my story, but it, that, that sort of personality driven news. Um, and maybe that's part of your reason, your, the answer to your question about Oprah, about why will there not be another Oprah or if there will be another Oprah, because everybody's trying to be Oprah or Martha Stewart. <laughs> Everybody wants that, you know, to be, you know, and, and it's, it's also unfair too. the way we've talked for years about, is it fair that a politician have to be somebody who looks good and sounds really good? If they're a really good administrator, uh, politician, why do they have to be this whole package? And that's what, what you have to be in journalism now. You have to look a certain way and you have to sound a certain way and be quick on your feet and pithy and live shots and live events, like you say. And, and so that, that troubles me. I myself, and this may be because I'm getting older or just tired, or I just, I love reading history. I love reading about how things were depicted at the time that they happened. I love uh, reading nonfiction accounts of things that happened in the past. And I, I challenge myself not to be consuming day of media with a frenzy the way so much of society does. I subscribed, I think since I last talked to you, I subscribed to The Economist and I, I don't even look at the app is great and they do all kinds of live programming and all that kind of stuff, but I get it. And the first thing I do is I turn to the back for the obit, which is the best obit ever in, in The Economist every mm. week. It, it helps me understand the world in a different way because it is an international mm. publication more than it is, you know, a U.S. centric publication. But I so so I feel utterly unqualified to answer what you're saying, because I, um, although I wish everybody would do what I'm doing and then I can start a cult and then I could be really famous like <laughs> Oprah and, you know, <laughs> no, but I, I just, I, I just having watched all of this unfold and it's been so exciting, especially that web period, that, that post uh, Netscape IPO period and that time at the New York times, it was such a thrill now it's just kind of like, because I've seen it, I feel like it is all cyclical mm -hmm. and I'm eager to see what you and others cook up next. But um, I just, I do wish sometimes in this kind of old person's, I'm not that old, but you know, I back retro concept of it was better when you just had the news delivered at one time during the day or two times during the day and in the morning with a morning newspaper. It's, it, there's just something yeah. nice about it. You know, obviously if you're in the industry, mm -hmm. it's different, but I, I also just, I, I worry too about this whole notion that because Trump is gone, there's nothing to cover. 
maybe the, maybe the DC press corps, White House press corps has nothing to cover because Joe Biden is just doing his job. But th- it just seems like there's so much for us to, to investigate and understand about the world around us that we're not we're not catching. Well, you one, see, quick thing okay. I, sorry, one quick thing. I yeah, want to no, go ahead. Because because it came up from what your earlier comment. It's not that there's nothing to cover. It's just that the business model and the format of a specific style of news isn't equipped to cover that thing. And that's why, oh, once again, the conversation about podcasting and newsletters are really yeah. exciting because right now what's, I mean, there's, there's some really fascinating sub stacks out there. There's a sub stack that I, I can't remember her name, unfortunately, but there's just a professor who does really in-depth U.S. history. And there are people who love that. Yeah. Right? She's you know, like we'll, the top lady too. Nobody yeah, talks yeah. about her. She's like yeah. literally the top well, person. But, but this about. is the key thing. Yeah. No one talks about her because once again, it's not as if the audience here is yeah. massive. There just are something I think in the low tens of thousands of people that will pay for it. So what I think people, what, what I think anyone who's interested in this topic because people reach out to us asking about journalism a lot, really think about as you're looking at your career, what format is necessary and best at telling the stories you're trying to tell, which is that if you're trying to go deep, if you're trying, for example, I would hate to do this conversation with you, Lisa, in a five minute cable hit. Like, oh, so, like, like, like Sagar, what if, what if we, what if we brought Lisa on Rising, which is Sagar's YouTube show? That'd be what three minutes, twelve, You'd have 12 to, minutes, yeah, totally. to, yeah, at 12, twelve minutes at best, rounds, and, like, and it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Right. It's not enough. It, it, it's, you know, you said you were qualified. I think you're 10 times more qualified because the thing is, and you know this, the people who are in the business are oftentimes the people who know the least amount about what's actually happening in the business. As in like, <laughs> what is that? Like, what is the business of your publication? You may want to find out because uh, from my perspective, you don't look all that relevant um, in terms of where things are happening. I do want to, by the way, your articulation there of history is so important, and it's something, when I was a White House correspondent, it killed me about how many people there had no idea about the subjects they were reporting on. My favorite one from this is that they didn't know who Dan Quayle was. The people who were in the White House press corps did not know who the former vice president of the United States, not even a couple of years, like a couple of terms ago, who wow. was someone was like, who is Dan Quayle? And I was the like, ultimate are you erasure. The are you literally erasure. serious right now? <laughs> like, like I, I couldn't believe it. And that's just one of like a million different anecdotes that I could give everybody. And the articulation there about why you need to read history if you're gonna try and understand, you're actually that is what makes you, I believe, qualified to project the future. Um, I mean, the Mark Twain quote is super cliche, but it is true. History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So from that perspective, you are a huge biography nerd um, like we are. Give us your top three to five recommendations. Um, We'll create a book list um, for this that people can go and buy specifically recommended by Lisa. So go ahead. Wow. You know, I hope you've read the Walter Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs. Of course. Of course. Oh, Check. that yeah. book is amazing. And a lot of people yeah. freaked out because it's so fat. It is so, so important. Good. And yeah. it's so important for the younger the people are, the more people should read it. But everybody should read it. It was such an important book. Um, you know what? I, I just I, I'm I'm in biography school right now. I just read my first Doris Kearns Goodwin. Which one? Oh, which one? Team of yeah. Rivals. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Rivals. Another yeah. big fat one. And it was great. I, I'm not inclined to read her or that kind of work, but it was really instructive. I I didn't know much about Lincoln. I knew he was a great man. I now know he's controversial, but yeah, it, it, that was a fabulous. The reason that book book is so important is because Lincoln's greatness wasn't just emancipation proclamation. He was actually a phenomenal politician and that's what people did not understand until they read team of rivals that i certainly didn't know and it was it, it's been really excellent to read it you know we um in this class we read eminent victorians oh okay. yeah so of course uh, yeah it's okay funny. Here, you guys know that I'm all right very you are my, very very very, <laughs> very well okay. read and wow okay yeah. wow. you are my favorite people for and audio I listeners think, i just pulled I, I out a, my roommate's to... my roommate's copy it's not mine yeah. that's okay. the real confession it's well, not mine. we know what it is we know what it is okay yeah. that's pretty yeah. cool <laughs> that book we spent so much time talking about that book because 
it does these slice of life by, or not slice of life, mini biographies or short yeah. biographies, brief biographies. And they're all based on source material. He didn't know any of them. I mean, I think the best biographies often aren't because of course that's the kind of book I write, but, um, but I, that's not why I say that, but it, it really, really is so interesting to see how he drew these four people only one of whom I knew, Florence Nightingale, and I knew this much, and she was a nurse. I didn't know why she was famous. I just knew her name. But yeah, it's it's a really uh, interesting example of biography, and I just I really enjoyed it. I like that. I like the doorstop books. Occasionally, we're reading. Um, this week, we read Oscar Wilde by Richard Elman. Not mm-hmm. not as interesting to me. And next week, we're reading Francis Bacon by my professor, Annalyn Swan. And her husband, Mark Stevens, you know, it's hard for me to say best, but best biographies, but de- without question, the Walter Isaacson is aces. It's it, oh, it, it be required reading. I mean, it's just. It's, and, and what I'll just say real quick is um, to tie a knot on this. So Steve Jobs, excellent book to understand the world before 2011. Absolutely. In the sense that Steve Jobs death to the tech side of the show we do. Steve Jobs' death is really just this demarcation line yeah. between the optimistic, really positive facing Silicon Valley that you were covering, that was in many ways literally funding the MSNBC <laughs> that existed through the partnership with Microsoft, and the really contentious, hyper political one we have today. Uh, Team of Rivals, we'll put these in the bookshop link for everyone. Team of Rivals is just, it's A, a great book. But it's also an interesting look into the word 2007, 2008, because it is one of those books that was like a fashionable Washington book in Mm. the sense that a lot of people in 2008 would say things like, hey, President Obama, you need to have a team of rivals. So an argument for bringing Hillary in this in in his biography, in his autobiography, President Obama says that wasn't why he picked Hillary Clinton as secretary of state. But there was actually a lot of like talk at the time of he's trying to have this team of rivals cabinet. So it's one of those books that really influenced perception and language people use. And it's fascinating when someone could write a humongous book. I mean, we're talking about Audible. It's a 40-hour Audible book. So yeah. the fact that you could write that book and that could influence it. And then Eminent Mcthorians, it's a fascinating book because it's really about, it's an indictment of a generation and a specific class of people. It's it's a it's written. We talked about this with Helen Andrews at the start of, of the season, but it's 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 a book. If it's about how Victorian Brit Britons in different categories, whether it's General Gordon and um, Sudan, so the British Empire, Florence yeah. Nightingale, you know, do gooderism, the Anglican Church, all these different facets of British Victorian society. How could these amazing people? build the world that led to world war one and the, it's really written like in that context so it's it's, it's fascinating so it's not it's not quite as fashionable as the other two but a huge yeah. recommendation i've got Absolutely. one more for you too it just was saying that it is the new eleanor roosevelt biography by david michaelis oh i haven't read it i heard good things i know it's, what's the name again it's Eleanor. It's, yeah, it's, it's very straightforward. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, a, it's apparently the only single volume biography of Eleanor's whole life. And it is, you know, it's one of those, it does what biography does best. It's about Eleanor, but it's about the time in which she lived. And her story alone, I didn't know the backstory, uh, is so dramatic and tragic. And then, you know, enter that was that's even before she married Franklin and then yeah. their lives, their lives together. It's 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 an, it's an exceptional work, as is all of his work. But that's it's, that's a really good one. It's funny. Some of those early American aristocrats were like more globalist in a way than like many current. Global. Like she was raised in the UK. You know, it's like or like I remember reading about Teddy Roosevelt and he's like gallivanting in in the Holland and like living with his like Dutch Egypt in the people. Middle yeah, East, like, learning German of like, a German family. I'm like, I don't even get to do this. You know, like I'm like, what what is going on here? I I should have been born as a as an early aristocrat. Okay, we could probably literally talk about this for hours. We should bring you back just to do an entire book show lisa thank you so much for joining us we are gonna be uh we have we'll have a link to your book um in the show notes on our bookshop as well as all of your other recommendations is there anything else for people to find you uh lisa napoli.com there we go oh wait there is there is there is one final final question lisa what's the next book (gasps) oh yeah right 
So I'm thinking, I'm not exactly sure yet, but I recently found out about an exchange program at a woman's college in the 60s that sent white, that, that brought black women to the Wellesley College campus to go to school for a year. And I'm really interested in what happened to the women who came there. It went on for about six or eight years, but I'm not sure I'm going to write a book about that yet. But isn't that interesting to think that oh, in, that the 60s, in, in, you know, in upper crust, New England, a rich school brought the women in from schools down South. They took the junior year and they spent the year there. It just sounds like a movie. Like what happened? How did they all get along? Right. And, and how it all came about. But I'm, I'm really kind of taking a break right now because I'm not yeah, really that's, sure. That's Can I make a that's plea fair. though for Two one in a thing? Row. Yes. Can I make a plea for one thing? So yeah. I was looking for a good biography of Sam Walton and it doesn't exist. So I don't know anything about Sam Walton. He died when I was a baby, literally. Walmart, like a, a founder month. of Walmart. Of course, no, no, no. Of I thought that there was one. I know that his daughter intrigued me because after I wrote the Joan uh -huh. Crock book, I was looking at Alice, but- I didn't know that there wasn't one about. So him. he's written. An, he's written an autobiography. There but are a I, couple like what you know, like, but there's no definitive bio of Sam Walton. And I'm reading this dude's biography right now. And he, first of all, kind of hilarious because it was written in 1992 with very different cultural norms. I'll just say <laughs> in terms of some of the language that he uses. Um, but I really imagine. interesting figure. Uh, I was because I was reading a biography of Bezos and Bezos was obsessed with Sam Walton. So I was like, oh, well, I should go read a biography of Sam Walton. And I could not find a good one. And given how many awesome ones you've done, I'm like, Lisa needs to do this. So, so I've now amazing. confronted you on the air. Well, that's good. No, yeah. I'm glad you did. And I wonder yeah. if you, would you read a book about the New York Times, Cyber Times, and the web? Oh, hell yeah. The, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, so you, wait, I'm, Lisa, Lisa, I'm Lisa, crazy. Lisa, I would also read it. Let's so, what's, yeah. what's, yeah. what's pitch, what's yeah. pitch you on air for this. The reason why... There is just a segment. No, I'm going to put it a better way. Um, we keep on going, so just stop. I know you have like commitments, yeah. so just if you stop. Have no, no, I've got to go in a little while. No, no, I'm good. Okay. Okay. So everything in our society today is fundamentally about the New York Times. Let's just run down the list. I have this revved up because I'm, I'm obsessed with it. One, debates about whether institutions work and whether they don't work. So for example, there is this massive fight not massive, but if you if you go on parts of Twitter, which you know in our private conversations you've referred to as toxic, so that's very much a true thing. But if you actually look at the New York Times' success, it's this fascinating story because it says something about, hey, like actually big centralized media institutions can be incredibly successful. The New York Times, like the the, the battle y'all were waging in the 1990s to take it online, the debate around whether or not content is free or not, the debate around individual choices, the story of where the Times now ended up with deciding, hey, like, let's actually just charge people. It, it's it's centralization versus decentralization. It's mm -hmm. personalities versus not. There, there's there's And this is the other thing too, so much of what the New York Times is now doing today is it's bringing together all these personalities. People call it the New York Yankees of newspapers now. So I think, you know, to compliment your work some more, what you do so well is just focus on these personalities. And it's just, I don't know, like, for, like for example, like Scott Galloway was on the board of the New York Times during the, during the 2000s. Um, during the period when the New York Times was not particularly successful, when yeah. Carlos Slim is coming in. So there's all these random things. There's so many stories about the fate of the press, the state of discourse, business, everything you could hit there. It's so much It's so much more than the failing New York Times Trump era debate that people sort of get caught yeah. up in. Right. No, right. if you did a cyber, the beginning of like where you were, and then like Iraq, Bill Keller era, I'm really going deep here. But wow, like, you're good. I'm impressed. Yeah, so, so you've got like Keller, and then you know there was like this fallout. Like 06 is like this weird thing where like everybody's like the New York Times is dead. What are they gonna do? The stock price is through the floor. Don't know if they should go all in on subscriptions. Then they do go all in on subscriptions. Now they're literally the most successful media company on earth. In addition to being like a uh, what they've got like their show on like FX or whatever. Yeah. They're one of those popular podcasts in the country. Their podcast mm -hmm. franchising is building out. They're essentially a talent agency for you know for a specific brand in addition to being dramatically successful you got a lot there uh i would i would read the hell out of that book of course you yeah. know what i'll do is the the five years that i worked there whatever it was and uh focus on a very torrid period of my life but that that won't be as interesting in the bigger no, sense that but. would be good i would <laughs> read it yeah <laughs> 
You sold two copies. If you, if you yeah, take okay, that to I'm, I'm your agent, you've got you got two pre. There's enough people who are listening to this podcast. Will buy. It. Okay. All right, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. Really thank you so much, time. Lisa. Thank you. You guys are great. Thank you so much. I can't. I, I can't thank. What a perfect way to launch the book. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Bye.